And in James today, and we're looking at James chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 14, but it's, uh, it's, we're going to talk about faith that is useful. I want, I want a faith that is useful, I don't want a faith that just stays with me, I don't want to just, uh, just have a belief and be okay with it, and we're going to look at a few different things, and this Bible, no, uh, so uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at a few different things today, I'm praying, I'm believing that we're going to be encouraged to, to not just have a, just not, not to be okay with my little badge, you know, I, I don't have a believer, but to have a useful faith, to have faith that is, that is used and lived out in our lives. So let's pray this morning before we enter the Word. God, we thank you that you are here, that you are present with us, that, Father, you never leave us, Father, you never forsake us. So, Father, we thank you for that. And, Lord, as we receive from your Word today, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here, would be speaking truth, would be reminding us of your Word, would be encouraging us and correcting us and uplifting us. Father, we thank you that you have ordained such a time as this for us to go through this book. Lord, we pray that we would receive these words and that it would produce much fruit in our lives. Yes. We thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So like we said, we're in James. And uh, let's turn, if you have it, James chapter 2, starting with verse 14. And we're going to look 14 through 25 here in a moment. But if you didn't know, there's some, there's some different um, controversies. You know the Bible is controversies? Do you ever know about that? Yeah, I've got, I, went to, I went off to Bible college, and I go to Bible college, and I thought, I thought everybody just reads the Bible and just like loves it and goes for it and just go. I mean, why, why do you talk about controversies and different things? Well, today we're going to get into a little bit of one because uh, we have some different theologians that think different, a little differently about different sections of the Bible. And so there seems to be sometimes a controversy between this section we're about to go through, James chapter 2, and another verse, that, uh, another uh, chapter and verses that we really enjoy as a, as a church and as a body of believers in Jesus Christ, in Ephesians chapter 2. And it seems to be, okay, what's going on here? So we've got one message that Paul gave in, and then Pastor James, like we like to call, Pastor James comes and he says, this, he says something, and it has something maybe a little different, a little different flavor, a little, maybe a little different feel to it. And, and then we know as we're talking about Europe and all these different things, that there's, there's theologians and, and moves of God. And, and, and we talk about Mr. Luther, that he came and, and he was really passionate because he saw in the church that there was something off. And specifically, he was looking at the church and said, it's all about works. And they're doing all these things, the works, and, and, he read, and he read for the first time, he was reading through a, the book of Ephesians, and he said, it's not about works. We can't, we can't earn our way to God, or what are we doing? And if you turn with me or, or know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not by our works, so that nobody can boast. And I, when I read the verse, I said, it's exciting, because no matter, I, I know who I am, and if you're somebody that's going to be honest this morning, you know who you are, and he said, you know, by my works alone, by who I am, I, I, I can't measure up. I, I can't do it. And so when I read Ephesians chapter 2, I get excited, just like Luther did. Said, Man, it is by grace. And to thank God that Jesus <laughs> went and, and took my place, because I couldn't do it, right? i, I got to be honest, I can't do it on my own. I need a savior. And, and so it's just like, like it was a man, yeah, I can't earn my way to heaven. I need grace. I need the, the favor of God. I need God's character pressed down upon me so that I can live a life that's worthy, uh, worthy to him, right? I, I need grace. But let's read here, Pastor James. What is James saying? Let's look. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 25 through 26 this morning. Now let's read. What good is it, my brother and sisters, if somebody claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother and sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, is dead. Oh, come on. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. I love how James doesn't hold back punches. I love the scripture. When you read it like this, I mean, it, it, it all, they just tell it. Tell it like this. Verse 20. You foolish person. 
Do, what, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for he did for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it is accredited to him righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Look at that verse 24. This is where like, sometimes people say there's a little bit of controversy here. What it was, who's, who's, who's side, Paul or, or God, James? What, what's going on? And, and it says in verse 24, you see that a person considers right is righteous by what they do, not by their faith alone. But yeah. we say, uh, and immediately when we read that, sometimes we're like, well, yeah, but what about grace? What about uh, what about this Ephesians chapter two? We got to understand a little bit of what Paul is speaking into. But Paul is speaking into a people, of, uh, especially correcting some some that that love their rules. If you look at the Old Testament, they had 613 rules that God gave them. But then they thought, you know, this isn't even enough rules for us. We've got to make some more rules. And they, they, they're, they're rule lovers. I don't know, I've confessed this before, that I like rules too. They, they help me. They know, I know where my drivers are. I was kind of a kid. Yeah, mom said, Is it? don't do this. I won't do this. Okay, we've got to wear a uniform to school. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm all right with that. I know what I'm going to wear the next day. You know, I was, I was kind of okay with that. But, but Paul was talking to him, people, and, and he was speaking to them. Hey, it, you don't have to earn your way. There's no rules that earn your pleasure or your place with God. And then sometimes, just like we, we, we hear a teaching, and we're like, all right. So then we swing to this totally other side. So, the, 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 so James speaking people that they love their rules, they're trying to earn their way to heaven. And so they go, okay, grace, I don't like this grace. And so they swing all of it. So then we have a couple decades later, James comes along and said, oh, wait a second. Let me, let me help you guys figure this out a little bit. And so this morning we're hoping that we get to, we get to be in that same boat. Okay, so it is the amazing message of the gospel is that we receive by grace. We receive not on our own merit. The grace of God. Thank you, Lord. But if we stay all the way over on that side, okay, well then no matter what I do, it's, it's alright. Oh, wait a second, Jim is saying. <clears throat> well, if you say you believe something, there's something that's gonna, that's gonna flow out of your life in response to that. So I think today, sometimes in our Christian law, the same as what James was addressing, sometimes there's a, there's a disconnect between the faith that I have and the life that I live. Somehow my, my faith is something personal, something private that I do on my own, but then the life that I live, I can figure all that out logically. I can, I, I can use my own reasoning and see, but I, I come to church on Sunday morning, or maybe I don't even come to church on Sunday morning. I, I just, I, I'm with the Word, and I've got this private thing going on with me and, me and Jesus, and, it, and it's, we separate it from our, our daily life. This is not how a Christian should be living. So why does this happen? You know, why does it maybe even in, in my life? And I hope this morning, again, we, we say this often, but I hope in this life that you're you're not listening for somebody else today. Right? We don't want to listen for the person who's not here. I, I wish that if they were only here, they could get No, you're present this morning, and this is the word of God for us who are gathered today, right? So why does this happen? I think one of the reasons why I, I, I've heard another speaker say this, and I, I really think that it's true, part of the reason why we have this separation, okay, my faith is private, my faith, the faith is for myself, and then how I live my life, I got this logical thing, and I want to figure it out on my own, apart from, apart from my faith. It, part of it is, I think, is an oversimplification of the gospel. Now, we've been trying to uh, talk about the gospel a lot, and, and if you get here on Sunday mornings or in our missional community, you're going to hear the gospel uh, all the time. And why? Because we think that the gospel is the formation of all that we do. Yes. Who God is, the gospel is good news, right? It's the good news about who God is and what he's done. And it changes who I am. And if it changes who I am, then I do differently because of what he's done and who he is, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important. But sometimes when we hear a presentation of the gospel, 
And maybe when I was younger in different church situations, I could say, yeah, I probably heard the gospel presented in this way. We usually talk about sin, right? Yeah. We've got sin, and we and what do we, what we know? Every, every good evangelist, every good pastor knows that when they preach about sin, the message is, don't do it. It's bad. That's right? right? <laughs> then, we've got Jesus. And we've got to be thankful for Jesus. Because Jesus saved us from our bad. And so, so then we get a little silent. Thank you, Jesus. And you see, and, 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 and then we want to respond because we know the bad, the pastor convinced us the bad is bad. Yeah. And hopefully the Holy Spirit also said the bad is bad. We've got to stop doing that. Thank you, Jesus. You want to help us get rid of my bad. All right. So then what is, what is the next step usually in, in, all, in all good gospel presentations? Now go live different. Go do different. So sin is bad. Stop doing it. Jesus is good. Thank Jesus he saved me from my bad. And now don't do it. Go, so, so it may look something like this, right? So we are preach, lying is bad. Don't lie. And I said, all right. And maybe we talk about the curse of lies, the destruction of lies. And, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and we need Jesus. Jesus is going to save us from our life. So now, what are we going to be? We're not going to be liars anymore. We're going to be truth talkers. So we've got to talk the truth. Well, those are really great. And maybe we have to think, even myself, I always have to think about this when I'm preaching the message and when I'm sharing the gospel with my friends. Am I just thinking about the bad behavior that is or the root of what, what, what's caused it in their lives, right? Yeah. The unbelief in their heart about who God is, right? But if we, if we boil it down just to your bad, Jesus saved from your bad, not just going to do good, we miss the whole, the whole picture of the gospel. So I love John 3, 16. God's love the world. He is the only God's son. We should have believed in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Man, it's, it's encouraging. That's great. But that's only that's a, that's a single point in the whole gospel. And I know what I'm about to say. Maybe it's a little bit hard. Maybe, maybe you might have a question. But I would ask that you hold your stones for just maybe 30 more minutes. But in a gospel that only starts and ends with the cross. Isn't good enough. Why? Because because then the next week we come back to service, and now we're going to talk about another sin issue. We're going to talk about sexual impurity. Don't do it. It's bad. Jesus saved you from the bad. Now go and be pure. And then the person that gave their heart to Jesus the week before says, "Well, I thought it was all about sinning. I kind of uh, about lying. I, I kind of like this other part of who I am." And, he doesn't need to save me from, from this issue. I mean, I'm, I'm good with this. We talked about this uh, previously in change, right? We like to hang on to that little thing that, that, and keep on doing it. Sometimes we don't want to give all, all ourselves to God. Now, if we only talk about one issue at a time, we only talk about the cross, and only, we don't get the whole picture. And so we kind of get a, sometimes we've got to get a, a, a greater picture. And because we don't have a greater picture, we've oversimplified the gospel and it becomes something small to us. It becomes just a singular issue and not our whole life. A whole life of redemption into who God is. It, it, it's void of the whole story of who God is. It's like watching a movie. You, you ever watch the trailers in, in the movie? You get a, maybe you, you watch Hulu or, or or you got a TV station and, and they got a commercial for a movie and you watch the commercial for the movie and it's like this amazing moment of like you know action and all of the great stuff. But it really doesn't tell you the clear picture of the whole story. And, and sometimes. I'll tell my friends, yeah, I saw that movie, or, or they're talking about a movie, and I think I know what it is. I'll, I'll say, yeah, I remember that trailer, and I, I say, no, that, that's not what the movie was about at all, Andy. I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, so just getting that one picture, we will fail to see the whole purpose, and I think that was what caused us to have this separation that we have sometimes, where our faith is something private, and then our personal life is something that, that we think out logically. How does this all, what's, what's a fuller picture that's going to enable us to be a people that live out our faith in our everyday life and not just in our, in our, in not just in our personal faith in our private times? So let's look here. What is this full story? And it starts with, it's rooted in Genesis 1, this creation story. Andrew, you're going, to, you're going to bring that up? And I said, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this up because if, if we don't get it, if we don't get this inside of us, then, then when we're living our daily life, we forget why we're living. Why is it, I had somebody ask me one time, Andrew, why is it that we, 
if, when we're saved, we don't just immediately go into heaven. We're just like, all right, we, we come to Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I receive you. And boom. Now, I mean, that would be great. That would be wonderful. But God has a purpose for us here on this earth. And, and it really hasn't changed from the beginning of the story. So when we, under, when we begin to see this in our the understanding of the gospel, begins to expand our lives, we see that it's not just a momentary thing that our salvation is about, but it's re-entering us into this grand story of God that he has a redemptive plan and he has a purpose for our life that he, that he states over and over again throughout the story of God. It's important for us to understand and for us to get this. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. This is an amazing statement about who we are as, as people, as humankind. Why, what is our purpose? Where are we, where is our starting point? What is this gospel story all about? That we were created, in verse 27, that God created mankind in his own image. The image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So there's an interesting thing in, in ancient times when kings would go and conquer other lands. If their, their reach went beyond the, their own country. So I have my own home country. I got, and, and as a king, man, I'm going and I'm expanding and I'm conquering other, other nations. And, and, it, and there's a far reach to my kingdom. So the king would establish, would, would put statues, they would put, they would put uh, statues of himself in all these extended regions of his kingdom. Why did he do that? It was to remind the people who was, who was in that city, they didn't get a chance to see the king every day. They didn't have YouTube channels and, you know, and all these different things where they could, they could have an image of, of the king right away and know, know who he was and know all of his tweets at 2 in the morning. I mean, like, he, they didn't have any of that. So there was, a, there was a physical statue of the king in all these lands, so people would know that's the king. That is crazy. But God knows what he's doing. That's right. And he has a plan here, and he begins to start this in Genesis chapter 1, and he says that he's going to create mankind, both man and female, and he's going to create them in his image. Yes. That's right. So then, no matter where we are, wherever we're going, we are to be the reminder, like the, the, king, the kings, they would establish a statue. We don't need any statues. We've got living men and women in this room who are a representation of God's image, yes. of His very character. So our purpose in life, this is what we're going to be repeated a few different times here, but our purpose in life is to be ones that bear the image of God, that live in the character of God. So when people get to, get to know Alan and they say, wow, it's not just Alan that I know. Man, I know that the, the, he, there's a character of God that I see in him. Yeah. And it draws the unbeliever to God. Yeah. That's right. This continues. He said, and he gives, he gives Adam and Eve, he gives them the command that they are to, what? They are to be fruitful and they are to multiply. Mm -hmm. The scripture talks about that the glory of God is to cover the earth as the waters do the sea. Right. You ever wonder how the waters cover the seas? It's interesting because they're, they're one, right? You can't separate waters from the sea. It's just like... So the, the glory of God is to cover the earth as the waters of the seas. How does this happen? Is it to go, go forth and Adam and go forth and, and cultivate the earth, right? And multiply. And the image of God then is multiplied and so we, as a church, we say, we want to be a church that makes disciples who makes disciples. Why? Because we want to multiply the image of God. We want, right. we want to go for them. This continues, right? Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve go. Then we, got, we, we know there, there's uh, turning away from God and the people doing their own thing. And, and then Noah comes, right? And he, and he, he saves the family of Noah. And then what does he tell Noah to do? Go. Same thing. Go. Care for the earth. Multiply. Protect the land. Go. Same, same thing. It's repeated over and over again. Then, then we'll be really encouraging. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 is a great moment. Abraham. Abram at the time. God speaks to Abram and he says this to him. He says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, 
and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. Yes. And I was, I was trying to sometimes I think, okay, why did God choose Abram? I don't know why God chose Abram. God chose Abraham, uh, Abram because he's God. And he found favor in God's eyes, and he, he chose him. And he said, I will bless you, I will make you a great nation, I will make you great, and you will be a blessing, and those who bless you will be, will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed, and all the people on the earth will be blessed. There we go. Yeah. All the this is the continuation, a continuation of this thing, that we're go for, we're to care for, we're to cultivate, and we're to multiply, and the image of God on all the earth, that we are to be blessed. No, he didn't tell Abraham, or Abraham at the time, that you're going to be blessed for your own sake. He didn't say, uh, you're going to be blessed so that you can be successful. He didn't say, you're going to be blessed so that you can be rich and famous. He didn't say, you're going to be blessed so that you can leverage your blessings, so that you can get more blessings, so that you can be a bigger name for yourself. He didn't say, I want to bless you so that you can have security, you can have your own little life, that you'll be, you'll be good and it'll be all by yourself and your family will be secure forever. He didn't, he didn't bless them for all those reasons. He blessed them so that they will be a blessing. Amen. And that all people will be blessed. And that we talk about church, uh, the church, at uh, Capital City Church. Uh, I, I've gone to different conferences and they've asked me, Andrew, you know, like, who, who is your target audience for Capital City Church? And so certain churches and, and certain church planning uh, conferences, they'll tell you, uh, hey, if you want your church to be successful and grow, you've got you to have a target. you got to have, uh, Andrew, what are you aiming for? You? And some people will, will call them, I'll, I'll call them River Church Sam. And say, like, okay, who's your river church Sam? You know, what do they look like? What is their income? What is their family like? What is, where do they live in town? Those kind of things. And I said, I can't do this. <laughs> I, said, I said, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> and as, a, as pastors, we said, we can't have that. We said, because if I go back to the beginning, and Abram, it says that we will be a blessing, and, and that we'll bless those who bless us, and that we'll be a great nation, and it says that all people on earth will be blessed through you. So it says here, all people, I said, we've got to make a church that has all people, and I love it when we get together, mission community, we get together on Sunday morning, because we've got, we've got wiser people, and we have younger people, and we have, we have people that are single, and married, and, and have kids, and don't have kids, and from this generation, and from this people, background, and this people group background, and this language, that language, and we're all together, because we know all people have been blessed, be blessed, and that all people will be blessed, there was. So how does, this, how does this master plan, we're talking about this story, right, that it begins, we're made in his image, then again, he says, go forth, care for, cultivate, multiply, and then he says, no, care for, cultivate, multiply, and he tells Abram, Abram, care for, multi uh, cultivate, and, and multiply, and then it goes along the line, right, Jacob, and then Isaac, and then we say, we got this person, and we got that person, we got that person, and then it gets to the, this guy, this person, fully man, fully human, and fully God, right? The Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus. But if we, if we can't lose the fact that throughout the whole story of God, God was making provision for all people, all people. So that we can start doing good things. We're placed back into his story, back into this grand narrative of the image bearers, ones that go forth in all of our lives to look like us, so that no matter where we are, people come in contact with the very image of God as they come in contact with those of us that have faith in him. Yes. It's no longer about 613 laws and all the added things after that. It's who is God and what is he like and how can I have my life bear the same yeah. witness that his life did. All the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders that came to Jesus, they said, Jesus, what's the most important command? How are you going to figure this out? And it's, it's interesting that, that Jesus, he quotes a, a scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that, that it's the beginning of all the laws that were 
were, were made. So all these 613 laws, right before that, this statement was made. Somehow we still forgot about it. Jesus had to remind them. Don't you remember? Matthew chapter 22. What's the greatest one? We love the Lord our God. Love him. Fall in love with him. Fall in love with his ways, with his character. Fall in love with who he is. Yes. Fall in love with what he does. Yes. Get that inside of you. And then love your neighbor as yourself. If I love my neighbor as myself, we over this last week, there's going to be no more hate, there's going to be no more discrimination, there's going to be no more anything in the world. I mean, I, I, now we do have some people we, we may have to uh, talk about, maybe you do not appreciate yourself, maybe you do not love yourself, and, and we think there's, that in Jesus there's freedom for that. But for the most part, I believe an overwhelming message is that we don't, Jesus was saying, we don't hate ourselves. We kind of want the best for ourselves. Want the same things you want for yourself, for a neighbor. And it changes how I live. It changes how I prioritize things. It changes how I interact with people around me. Because I love them and I want the best for them the same way I want the best for myself. I'm not going to be full of hate. My thoughts are, I want to challenge my thoughts. I'm going to challenge my stereotypes. I want to challenge the things that I live by because, man, I want to love them just as I love myself. Yes. And I always complete all of the rest. We complete the character of God. We get those two things right. It's not a list, but we've been given an identity as an image bearer, and our job in life is to care for, to protect, to multiply. So it's from sin, it's to God, for good works. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let's get back to this supposed controversy we're talking about in Ephesians. So those of you, you know, you know the scripture a little bit, you, you said, Andrew, you, you stopped. You're like, Andrew, you stopped. Why did you stop? There's more to that verse. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Is there a great controversy between Paul and James? And I want to say, no, there isn't. Why? Because look at Ephesians chapter 2, and we're in verse 8. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. You have been saved from your sin." And you can say to God, this is not from yourself, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that nobody can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, what? To do good works, Amen. which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Yes. So God saves us from our sins, He saves us to Him, for us, yes. for a purpose. For us to care, for us to cultivate, for us to multiply, for us to do the good works that He's prepared ahead of time, to bear His image in the earth in all situations, in all circumstances. But God is not against good works, but He is against earning your salvation. Yes. But God, is it, God is against our effort. Or God is, sorry, God is not against. I wrote this down here so I can get it right. I have to, I have to say it. God is not opposed to effort, obedience, or striving to be more like Him. Paul says that even in his word after we should go after it. But God is opposed to earning. Yes. So you're doing good works. You, we should strive after. We should give effort to. We should give effort to be in obedience. We should be giving effort to strive and to be more like Him. But we should know in fact that it's it, we're not earning. So I can't go to God. And say, God, I got my my checklist here of all the different scriptures that I've read this week and the five people that I gave money to. And God, thank you. Now you should bless them. I know we don't we don't think that way. All right. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we think, man, if, I, if I, I, I've been faithful in church, and I've been faithful to come to your, your missional community, I've been faithful, and all of a sudden something bad happens, and we go to God and we're like, God, why did this happen? I don't deserve this. I was doing all these great things for you. <laughs> well, it's, it's not, you didn't earn anything. We can't earn this. It's by grace. It's apart from any effort of our own. It's apart from any merit of our own. Because remember, we have in our own being of who we are, we have nothing compared to who Jesus is. We can't do it. We need it. So James, here, let's look at this. James chapter 1, verse 
James continues this, and, and I'm telling you, he, he doesn't hold back anything. He doesn't hold back the punches. He's given, he's given a few different, uh, a few different examples here. What does it, what does it look like to be a person? Three examples of what it looks like to have useful faith. To have faith that isn't just a private thing, isn't just for myself, isn't just for me to try to earn things, but it's something that I do and I have actions, right? He says, he 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 says this. It's not a useful faith if you just wish well, but you don't help somebody. Yes. Yes. If we confess that have faith in God, the same way that Jesus Christ lifted us up out of our miry muck and entered us back into the ability to bear the image of God, if He's done this for us, then when somebody else is in need of help, it's not just good enough to say, I'll pray for you. Mm -hmm. Wish you well. Hope it goes good. I know you're struggling a lot. I don't want it near me. No. He says, if you have faith in who God is, a faith that is useful is one that helps. Yes. A one that lifts up. A one that extends a hand. A one that goes through the muck and through the messiness and through the uckiness and through the dirtiness. And you know what? Sometimes it is ucky and dirty and messy. You know, I joke sometimes with my other pastor friends. They got, they got, they're like, why is your church like exploding in growth? I said, because it's messy. Because I'm willing to get in in people's lives and work it in and, and walk through it. And, and he said, well, I don't want those people in my church. I said, you know what? That's okay because they're going to come over to our church. And they're going to receive it. And, and we jabber back and forth a little bit. And, and he said, because I, I want them to look nice and I want them to be nice because I know when people come in, I want them to have a good experience. I said, you know what? They need Jesus. And they're going to take some messy. And we're going to get into it. But you know what? Because we have faith, we're going to be a people that help others out. Let's walk with you. He gives it another example. Your faith makes you willing to sacrifice family for the mission of God. Man, this is hard. <laughs> Abram. Do you know what God asked Abram to do? He said, you're going to be a great nation. You're going to bless a hundred people. You're going to have multi, you're going to have so many family members. You're going to, going to measure the sky, all the stars in the sky, how, how many family members you have. And so they waited. They waited for this, this baby. They, they're old. They said, they laughed at God. They said, you can't do this. It's impossible. And then a baby comes. And then God says, all right, sacrifice the baby. Give the baby back to me. Put the baby on the altar. The very thing that you've been waiting for to fulfill the promise that you think you had in me, go. Get rid of it. Yeah. We've got to be willing to sacrifice family for the mission of God. And Abram said, I'm willing. And it wasn't just his faith. He believed God. And he said, it was believed God that it was kind of righteous. But his belief in God led to action. He's up on the altar. He's getting ready to, to sacrifice the son, the, the very thing that's supposed to fulfill the promise that God had, <laughs> spoke to him. And said, I'm willing to, to sacrifice this. And God provides a sacrifice in his place in a moment. You see, his faith, in verse 22, his faith and his actions were working together so that his faith would make complete in what he did. What is God asking you to sacrifice? Man, kids, the kids' issue is a, is a big thing. Man, time issue is a big thing. Work issue is a big thing. But what is God asking you to sacrifice in order to bear His image more in the earth and the neighbors around you and in your family? What is He asking you to give? And are we willing to do the hard thing? Are we willing to sacrifice the hard thing so that our faith is made complete, so that we are partnered with Him and we do the things that He's asking us to do? And it's harder. The, the next one is even, even hits home even more. Verse 25, he begins to give the example of Rahab, who risked her very life yes. to serve God's people. Yes. Yes. A faith, when it's lived out right, is one that risked life to serve God's people. Yes. This afternoon, as we're uh, eating, I'm going to have an iPad and, and we're going to go around. There's some places in our church family that, that need a place. Uh, there's places that we need uh, people to step up and to serve. We, 
It was great this morning. I think we had a couple of greeters at the door who, who greeted our, our wonderful guests this morning, right? But they're, we need to have a rotation of people at the door. They're saying, you know, I'm, I'm willing to serve. We're not, I'm not even asking. Rahab was risking her whole life to serve. I think, I think I can ask some people to serve in some position of greeters or, or a tech team, so pastor and I don't have to do the, do the button every, yeah. every week, you know. Uh, a faith that is lived out is one that's willing to risk life in order to serve God's people. Yeah. She gave logic to the spies and sent them off in different directions. As a, as a body without spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. It's amazing that look, look at these examples here. He, he didn't use examples of the different sin issues. He could have said, you know, somebody that is full of faith is somebody that doesn't lie, or doesn't cheat, or doesn't have impure sexual behavior. He could have, he could have used all those, the different examples. But what is, what is the example, what is the message here that Pastor James is speaking to us this morning. And everyone, somebody that is full of faith is somebody that is full of sacrifice, that is willing to sacrifice. The example that I give, three examples, are all examples of sacrifice. It's hard, or it costs something to help another person out. Yes. Amen. But somebody that's full of faith understands what was sacrificed for me, who God is, and what He's done for me. Oh, I'm willing to sacrifice for the sake of the Abram, I, I'm going to sacrifice the very promise that God had in order to fulfill his, to fulfill obedience to him. It's sacrifice something. It's going to cost something. Rahab, I mean, this is the, 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 the prostitute in the town. And she's hosting the spies who are about to take over and destroy her whole city. It costs her something. But because we sacrifice, we're able to fulfill this promise that we will be a blessing. Yes. That we will be a blessing. Yes. And the image of God will begin to go forth. And people will see who he is and they'll desire him. Yes. And their lives will be changed. And the image of God will come to bear on who they are. And the image of God will go to the next one. What's so exciting about this church is you guys know in the last year, God did great things financially, but it was because God began to expand. And then we had five people get jobs in other cities. And we're like, yay! <laughs> but we, we know that we've got to celebrate, right? How many they got a job in California, Minnesota, and, uh, all over the world. We've got people that have jobs in other cities that were once in Cal City Church. And we, we're going to celebrate. But we do get to celebrate because we know now they're in China and they're in these places. And they, the image of God that came to bear on who they are, the character of God that began to, uh, to press upon who they are. Now they're in those other places and they can to again cultivate and care for and multiply. Yeah. I've got a friend in Guang, Guangzhou, China right now. And when he left the U.S., he said, Andrew, I can't wait to call you and tell you about the persons that I get to tell about who Jesus is. Because what he's told me changed my life. I did get to have a conversation with Hao recently, and he told me, hey, I just recently I had a conversation with my aunt, and she asked this question, hey, how do I answer this? When we are saved, it's not only, it cannot only begin and end with the cross. Because then we have these personal, private, faith life issues. It must be married with the overall story of who God is, that our life is into this story that we are the ones that care for, cultivate, and multiply the very image of God wherever we go, whatever we do. If we see our life this way, I believe that we'll begin to see ourselves as ones that are full of faith <coughs> and deeds. That like James says about uh, Abram in verse 22, that his faith was made complete by what he did. Married it together. So I want to ask you this morning in closing, what ways can I serve? What ways is God asking me to sacrifice so that his image may come to bear on others around him? And what ways is God asking me to sacrifice that his image may come to bear on those who are around me? Maybe there's some neighbors that, that God is asking you to say hello to, to befriend, and to care for. 
Maybe there's some family members, and man, you have a hard time with them because they got this issue or, or that issue. And God's saying, you know what? It's time for you to sacrifice, to share my image, to share who I am with them, to share some love. Maybe there is some positions here at church you can sacrifice. You say, you know what? It's, it's hard to be here at 8.30 in the morning, on Sunday morning, to, to help us set up here and, and get ready for worship and get ready for the gathering. But we need somebody to come here and say, you know what? Every Sunday morning or every other Sunday morning, I'm going to be here at 8.30 to help set up the computer so we can have words and we can have the slides. Yeah. Like the first song tonight or today, we didn't have the slides. Yeah. We're trying to get everything together. I need somebody else that says, I want to come here every Sunday morning. And, and we have a value that everybody is welcome here at Cal City Church. So we need some people that say, you know, I'm going to stand up there. I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of time. I'm going to come here instead of at 10 or instead of at 10.15. I'm going to be here at 9.45 or 9.30 so I can be a friendly face and say, hey, welcome here. I'm going to be the arms of God and wrap around you and welcome you into the house this morning. We're going to take some sacrifice. We're going to take some time. Talking about the finances, maybe it's going to take some sacrifice. Maybe I've got to cut out this thing so I can give to the Lord. Yeah. I believe that we can be a church that are not just full of faith, believe in God that He can heal Megan and, and raise her up, right? But are full of action. That our faith in who God is produces in us good works. Yeah. Let's pray this morning. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word. And God, I, I probably confess, God, I love your conviction. Father, I pray that we would be a people that love your voice. That even when you bring us a word like James does, it, and don't hold back, Father, that we would enjoy, we would have, take pleasure in receiving from you this morning. God, I thank you that you're raising up a people. Uh, you're raising up a family here in Madison that is willing to say, not only do I believe in who God is, but it changes how I live. Father, I pray that we would get those two things right, that we would love you, and then we would love our neighbors. Father, that you would encourage us to take those steps of sacrifice, to help those that are in need, not just to give a well wish. Yes. Father, that you would help us to sacrifice the very promises that you give us in order that we may see others come to know you. Help us to be willing to sacrifice in order to be obedient. Our Father, just like Rahab, Father, help us to be willing to risk our lives, to lose our lives for the sake of bearing your image to others. Father, I pray that we would be a church that sees our lives in the full story of God. And we are saved by grace to do the good work of sharing your character with all those who are around. 